All right. Well, here we are. We're, we're working our way through the, the book of Romans. We, we've just started here working through Paul's introduction. And in this introduction, we first saw that the gospel of God is just that, the gospel of God. That Paul starts out with his focus on God. God the Father concerning his Son and this powerful gospel that we saw brought love and brought brought made us beloved and brought mercy and and and, and the focus of of, the, of that in here in the introduction and as I think about the gospel of God uh, it reminds me of, I was listening this week to a podcast about the life of Martin Lloyd Jones and Martin Lloyd Jones has been one of the commentaries I look to. And Martin Lloyd-Jones started out as a, uh, a doctor in London. And he was on the course to be a very famous doctor in London with a very prosperous medical practice. And what Martin Lloyd-Jones found among the people that came to him that were sick, that so many of those folks that came to him had no physical ailment, but their spiritual ailment worked itself out in physical ways. And as much as you have folks that are sick, if their real problem is spiritual, he wasn't able to help them. And this is something that really moved Martin Lloyd's Jones's heart to, to transition out of this very profitable, profitable <laughs> medical profession and to become a little country pastor in his, his town of Wales. So in 1926, he departed with his wife from England and returned to that native Wales to a very small town to preach the gospel. His desire was to preach the gospel that can truly meet the spiritual needs of people, then in turn, that would take care of their physical needs and their eternal spiritual needs. Uh, be able to really help people uh, from, from the heart outwards. Uh, he eventually would head back to London and be a pastor at Westminster Chapel. And as we look at the gospel of God today, and we look at exactly what that looks like, it changes someone through faith in Christ and makes them justified. It brings them salvation. And then in turn, though, they walk out this faith in life. It changes the way your life is. The gospel so affects you towards God that now you're able to live with confidence in life. These things that Martin Lloyd-Jones saw that changes people so that the just shall live and walk by faith. And nothing more exemplified that than during the Second World War, he's in Westminster Chapel, and they would get bombed regularly. They called it the Blitz on London. Germany would bomb, be bombing Eng England. And on a certain Lord's Day, he's at his pulpit, he's praying before his people, and the chapel gets hit with a bomb. <laughs> And he didn't even miss a beat. He kept praying right along. And it just goes to show you as we look here at the power of the gospel, that this is such a power to change us towards God, but to give us a real confidence in this difficult, broken world. Uh, we saw last week that Paul had this pastoral heart of love, his desire to come and be with those people that he might impart to them some spiritual gift. We'll, we'll see here today that he wanted to bring fruit to those folks in Rome. And the fruit was twofold. Fruit of bringing people to repentance, bringing people into the church, bringing people to God through Christ, and then those that are there to build them up in their faith. And, and I want to see here there's a twofold nature of this power of the gospel. It's the power of the gospel message to save, but it's always the power of the gospel message to transform. We live in a culture and a world that's just under pressure from, from every side. Folks that are struggling, looking for a way to cope and to live. And it's only the power of the gospel that can really set someone free to make them right with God and then to allow them to live as God intended them to. So open your Bibles here, and we're going to look again at Romans chapter 1. And we're coming right now to really what I think is, you know, when you watch a movie, and I've said this before, and, and you've got all the different things that are going on in that movie, 
You've got different uh, uh, protagonists, antagonists. You've got things that are, that are moving the story, and it's moving towards a climax. And in, in redemptive history, it's very much the same way. That man has, has, was created good in God's image, then the fall came, and there was all the prophecy. We saw that, that, that eventually there would be a redeemer. There would be a Christ, a Messiah. And then that's when really things changed, the turning point in God's story. And today, these two verses we're going to look at really, I think, are the culmination of all of redemptive history, verses 16 and 17. Uh, all the comment, comment, uh, commentators say the th same thing, that this was the, the focus. Romans being that one book that crystallizes uh, all of the gospel. The whole book points to that. But more than that, these two verses point to what God has done to make man right in his eyes and to allow them to walk as they're intended. Lloyd-Jones says this, It is obviously then that I think that we are at a very important and momentous point in our study of this great epistle. I suppose that, in a sense, there are no two verses of greater importance in the whole of scripture than these two verses which we're considering. That's what we're going to consider here today. He mentions himself concerning Martin Luther. We know the Reformation was spawned by Luther who strived to do all he could to be right with God. If someone were to be saved by being a monk, he was as good as you can get. And you'll find though that good works never get you there. He was still struggling. He said concerning Martin Luther, it was the realization that came to him of what exactly was being said to him through these two verses that proved to be the turning point in the life of Martin Luther. Every single person that lives has to come to grips with these two verses. Either these two verses are going to be the turning point in your life at some point, and it's going to make the difference between life and death, and between darkness and light, if you don't understand the gospel, if you're a Christian today and you don't understand these two verses, it's going to affect your whole life and being. But once you do come to understand these things, that turning point in history that Christ brought, these same turning points happen in each of our lives. So it's that critical for us to try to, to uh, consider these two verses. So stand with me. I want to read what leads up to this. We're in Romans chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 13 through 17. Romans chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you. Also, just as among the other Gentiles, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your revelation that, Lord God, it's, it's, it's you that uh, are, are the 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 means by which, God, we're able to understand and see anything. Lord, that you reveal yourself to us truly. And as we look at these very important verses, Lord God, I pray that you might open our hearts and our minds, that we might understand them more clearly. Those of us, Lord God, that have been Christians for years, that it might be a means to spur us on to share this powerful gospel with others. For those of us, Lord, maybe that haven't come to a full understanding, I pray that you might open hearts and minds by grace that, that people might be able to embrace the gospel. But Father, I thank you that you are a good God who has provided greatly 
for our salvation. So I pray that you might bless our time in your word today. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. You may be seated. So right here at the beginning, in verse 16, you see that Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And when Paul says, I'm not ashamed, I think we have seen that folks are apt to be ashamed of the gospel. That even in his time, there are those that would be ashamed of God. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you before my Father. That there is a call on man to recognize what is right. But the fact that Paul here is encouraging them that, that he's not ashamed, it's to encourage them not to be ashamed. I think of Timothy uh, in that great verse. You know that verse you always think of, for God's not given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and of a sound mind. I think about that verse, and I think it's, oh, so I shouldn't be afraid, and I, or I shouldn't fear this or that in the world. But right in context, the very next thing he says there is, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. So Paul, more than anybody else, through what he went through, the conversion that God amazingly turned him from what he once was and revealed himself to him, he was not ashamed. But some of us are apt to have this very struggle. I don't know if you're today here today as a, as a Christian, if you've ever been ashamed to share the gospel. You know, it, it, the problem is with the gospel is people don't want to hear it. <laughs> the, the gospel is the power of God for salvation, but this power of the gospel is such that we've seen that you must preach to them that they're lost in sin. You have to tell them it's not of their power. And people like to be involved in their own salvation. And they don't want to hear their sins. We're going to see that, that here Paul is going to describe to us that the gospel that brings righteousness, but the wrath of God and unrighteousness is what folks are caught up in. They much prefer to repress that truth in unrighteousness. And it happens to all of us. I can remember as a new Christian, you know, you want to be cautious about when you share what you believe or that you are a Christian. Now today in our society, you're, you're going to come into a little bit of adversity if you try to tell them about Jesus or what he did for you. Even this week, I brought Abigail's car to be worked on, and I ran into a lady that we knew from years in the past. And we knew them real well. Our kids played Little League Baseball together. And as I'm dropping off the car, I kind of start sharing a couple things. And then I said, I, I'm always studying. And even in the, my mind, I thought, do I tell her I'm studying because I'm a pastor? And so I just said studying first. But before that was over, I made sure I shared the whole kit and caboodle. So what I'm telling you, though, that even up to this point in my life, it's so much easier not to bring that up, to not bring that type of whatever it is. But we cannot be ashamed of the gospel of God. Uh, it's the power of God for salvation. I, I remember last year, again, when I went to the Southern Baptist Convention, that, that, that the, the problem with the, the drift in that convention is that they don't want to seem out of step with society. That they don't want to bring the reproach of man, so they'd like to make a gospel that seems comfortable. Or, or make it seem uh, like it's just like anything else. And, 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 and share it in such a way that you, you, you're kind of like one pastor would say, whisper about some of those terrible sins. But the gospel is offensive. The gospel calls people to turn from the most wicked of sins and to recognize that they can't do it on themselves, and it humbles them. But they said, no, no, the world is watching. But we as Christians, and they should recognize, God is watching. So we cannot be ashamed to preach the gospel because it's the power of God to salvation. Uh, Robert Haldane says this about how folks kind of water down the gospel. It's also observable that the more the gospel is corrupted and the more it, its peculiar features are obscured by error, the less do we observe of the shame it is calculated to produce. It is, in fact, the fear of opposition and contempt that often leads us to the corruption of the gospel. Fear of man as opposed to fear of God. And listen, Paul had gone through the gamut. Paul had been delivered from a great sin. And, and for him, 
There was nothing that was going to keep him from being proud of this gospel. And it's not just that, but we're going to see that he's proud of it because it is the power of God to salvation. You know, this gospel isn't a, 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 a get quit, uh, fixed. It's not, it's not smoke and mirrors. It's not something we have to work up or talk people into. This is the power of God to salvation. The strength of it comes from God himself. And also that should encourage us that, you know what? It doesn't much matter what you say because it's God that will open hearts and change, change hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, and this idea of salvation, the power of God to salvation, when you talk about salvation, that turning point in man's history, the wages of sin is death. The power of sin is not going to just ruin your life. It's going to land us in eternal damnation. The stakes are so high, it's just as I've said before, not a matter of life and death, but it's a matter of eternal life and eternal death. And Paul was a man that was motivated by love. He'd been delivered from such a serious damnation that he was more than proud to preach the gospel. Again, Haldane, the gospel is the great and admirably an admirable mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God in which the angels desire to look whereby his manifold wisdom is made known unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places it is the efficacious means by which God saves men from sin misery and bestows on them eternal life the instrument by which he triumphs in their hearts and destroys in them the dominion of Satan this is the power of God unto salvation. Are we going to be quiet about that? We need to speak up and let that word out. It, the, the point of the power is, you know, we saw earlier there in Romans that Jesus declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. What is the power behind this gospel? The power of this gospel is to turn from death to life. The power of this gospel is that, that Jesus laid down his life for the sins of those who might believe in him. He was buried in a tomb and he rose again from the dead. And that same gospel raises all that would believe. The one that really impresses me about this power of the gospel, in Ephesians, Paul says this, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in his own right hand. That power of the gospel that brings salvation, the very same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in the believer. To raise us out of death to life, to raise us, like we were talking this morning, it, 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 we're dead, we can do nothing. The power has nothing to do with what we're saying. It's God who changes men, women, children to hear this gospel. It's a gracious mercy, but it is very real in what it accomplishes. The power of God is the power that brought Jesus back from the dead. And that's the power that's in work, at work in the believer. That's this gospel, of course, that Paul is not uh, ashamed of. This is that gospel that he's, he's proud of. But what's very interesting in there, you see that there is a caveat. This gospel of salvation is not universal. It's not for everybody. There are only those that believe who will partake of this salvation. And we know that the, the, the faith to believe is a gift of God, but, but, but do we believe? See, see, you talk about it, we, we, talk, we talked this morning, and I, when we're looking at that, and you look at this idea of effectual call, you look at that it is God who is sovereign in salvation, because God's letting us into who he is, his nature, his attributes. The salvation is God's salvation. It's God's uh, gospel. But, very real, you sitting here today are convinced of it and come to that gospel by the preaching of his word. You truly have to repent and believe the gospel. 
The caveat is you must believe. So as we preach, we preach winsomely. We preach with our whole heart. We're not ashamed of the gospel. I don't know why God decided to do it this way, but it would have been easier if he just did it all himself. But he chose to use men and women like you and I. So first and foremost, as a Christian, we have got to understand what a great salvation we have, what the power of that salvation is, and then how to articulate it. You know, you, you don't just sit there and just close your eyes and it just flows on to you. We have to understand the scriptures. We have to study the word of God. We have to look at these two verses that are ever so important and see what exactly is God saying. And he'll open our hearts if, if he would. But for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, the message says it this way. It's news I'm most proud to proclaim. This extraordinary message of God's powerful plan to rescue everyone who trusts in him, starting with the Jews and then right on to everyone else. So God makes this, 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 uh, th this gospel available. You hear the gospel. If you're here today and you've not embraced the gospel or believed the gospel, at that second coming, when he judges the living and the dead, you'll be responsible for what you heard. But if today you hear the gospel preached and you come to it, it'll be because he opened your heart and mind. And it's a mystery, but it's a wonderful mystery. And it's talking about this idea of the righteousness of God. Uh, point two, that the gospel makes right by faith. Like I said, it is, there's a caveat. You must believe the gospel. You must trust the gospel. For in it, in the gospel, verse 17, it says the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And this righteousness of God, this justice of God, you've got God who is perfectly holy, who is perfectly just, who will judge every sin that you and I commit. The caveat of belief makes it this way, though. Either you will pay for your sin, or through faith, Christ will pay for your sin. Either you will be forgiven and receive the justice of God, the righteousness of God, which is a gift through faith, or you've got to pay it yourself. That seems pretty mean, doesn't it? God's a real meanie. That's why when people preach the gospel, they try, to, they try to kind of rub that edge away and say that you know God doesn't send people to eternal damnation. He does. He does. Our decisions make a big difference. This is something we know that, that Martin Luther struggled over, that, that turning stone in his life, that turning point in his life was based on the idea he didn't only think that God was just and that the law was impossible to keep, but when he looked at this verse, he saw that by it the righteousness of God is revealed. He thought the gospel was just as judgmental as the law. He says, when it says there in verse 17, in it the righteousness of God, he thought that in the gospel, the justice and righteousness of God was revealed, that God will continue to judge just as harshly. But this is where he was lecturing on Romans, and there's a turning in his own life. And the way he describes it, I think, is very important and instructive for us as believers to understand what is God saying in this verse? What is the justice of God? Can we be forgiven? Can we be right with God? Luther says this, although I was a holy and irreproachable monk, my conscience was full of trouble and anguish. I could not bear the words justice of God. I loved not the just and holy God who punishes sinners. He even once said, I hate God. I was filled with secret rage against him and hated him because not satisfied with tearing up, terrifying us, his miserable creatures, already lost by original sin with his law and the miseries of life, he still further increased our torment by the gospel. <laughs> and you can see why people think, how can God be loving and just? How can a loving God send innocent little folks like you and I to hell. But Martin Luther knew there was a quandary here. 
that God was righteous and he would judge righteously. But the thing is, this verse here talks about the most inexplicable love of God that would make the believer right with God. Something that is a complete miracle. Uh, Martin Luther says it this way, but when, and this is what I said earlier, we do have to believe only those that believe, but those who do believe, it'll be the Holy Spirit that opens your heart and your mind to understand these deep and difficult things. He said, but when, by the Spirit of God, I comprehended these words, when I learned how the sinner's justification proceeds from the pure mercy of the Lord by means of faith, then I felt myself revived like a new man and entered at the open doors into the very paradise of God. From that time also I beheld the precious sacred volume with new eyes. I went over all the Bible and collected a great number of passages which taught me what the work of God was. And I had, and as I had previously, with all my heart, hated the words justice of God, so from that time I began to esteem and love them as the words most sweet and most consoling. In truth, these words were to me the true gate of paradise. And if we do not rightly understand the gospel as presented, not rightly understand that this justice and righteousness of God is imputed to the believer because of the finished work of Christ, then we won't be able to really appreciate it. But when we do, we too can walk through those gates of paradise. Then life takes on a complete new meaning. I remember Martin Luther saying that, because when, when Martin Luther became a monk, he read the scriptures. He read them always. Everybody didn't have the scriptures back then. When he went to the Augustinian monk, Augustinian monastery, they gave him a copy of God's word. They made him the teacher of the Bible, but it didn't make sense. He was just learning as he went, kind of like we with our children, teach them the word of God, indoctrinate them in the word of God, do, do your catechizing, because when by faith they come to Christ, now Martin Luther said all of these scriptures made sense to him. All of a sudden, now when he opens his Bible, he was just enthralled with this mercy and love of God. Because really the focus of all of redemptive history culminates in the work of Christ. That he might make us righteous before a just God. No one can earn heaven. No one can be good enough. Man is made right with God, justified only through faith alone in Christ alone. So, so the thing is, as much as Martin Luther is trying to work his way to heaven, as much as man thinks we're pretty good and we want to work our way to heaven, you have to realize <laughs> none of that will ever amount to a hill of beans. So as you trust in Christ, though, and you recognize that that justification, that righteousness is completely imputed to us, it's a complete free gift. We were, 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 were dead in sins. Our righteousness is filthy rags and completely separated from God, with the wrath of God resting upon us. But what Christ accomplished is now we can be clothed in righteousness, that his good deeds are imputed to us, and our sin is put upon him. And this is the great exchange. This means salvation and deliverance is through firm, reliant faith, which we know also is this gift of God. When he grants us faith, we firmly rely and rest on Christ and his finished work at the cross. The penalty has been completely paid. The weight is taken off of our shoulders. That, that understanding of that truth brings true comfort. Um, I think about Paul who said of himself that he was that chief of sinners. Uh, you know, and that, that in him... God would show forth a pattern for love and, and care for all of us that are like sinners. That, that this God is merciful and loving and is made away. I guess it's like this. I do our checkbook and I work our way each month and sometimes I'll get behind and I've got a lot of checks I've got to write back in there. And every now and then I've got to switch money from the savings account because I'm upside down. 
right? And, and, and thank goodness at this point in my life I've got that. I remember when I was younger and we didn't. We'd have to, you know, rob from Paul to pay Peter and such. But, but in the economy of God, man is in the red. We could never, ever pay that debt. Your bank book is bouncing and bouncing and the creditors are at the door. And the main creditor is the creditor that will put you in hell forever. But Christ makes a way that your books are balanced, that you're in the black, that he forgives your sins, past, present, and future. That's the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. That's what this salvation is talking about here. When he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. All we need to do is believe, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. You are able to receive this righteousness that makes you right, which is completely a gift and based upon faith based upon nothing that we've done, but based solely and completely upon what Christ has done. It's kind of like this. I, I don't know if you've ever been out at the swimming pool. we got a lot of grandkids. And I'd heard this guy telling a story, and it happens all the time. If you ever have one of your children on the side of the pool when they're like two or three, they're very skittish. But, but the child that recognizes that dad's going to catch them, like Trevor's kids might not jump in my arms, right? His papa's going to drown them. But, but they'll jump in Trevor's arms because they trust him. They trust him totally. They rely completely on him. And this gospel is like that. The gospel of the Father is such that we need to, by faith, jump in and trust all that he's provided concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have to trust. We have to completely rely upon him. It's the power of God. He, he's quoting here from Habakkuk. And back in Habakkuk, you don't have to turn there, but Habakkuk said this, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. You notice that the, the person that is lost and, and, and heading in the exact opposite direction of God, they're proud. They are proud. Pride is one of the worst sins, but someone that comes to the end of themselves, what the gospel will produce is true humility. It'll bring us to the end of ourselves and say, you know what? I can't do it. Father, I need you. I need your help. And it's a revelation of God, but it's a wonder. Romans 1, 17 again. For the gospel, for in the gospel, this is the NIV. They kind of ex explicated, I think, which is helpful to understand what this faith is, this completely unmerited favor of God through grace, this faith. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. There's no adding in your works. There's no you trust Jesus, and now let's try hard to really please God. We could never please God any more than who we are in Christ. Our salvation is completely based on what he has done. It has so so many people. You get saved, right? You go. I remember when I got saved. I go. I'm going to be Billy Graham. I'm going to do some big things for God. And in God's mercy, He let me fall flat on my face. God forbid you come to Christ and you're going to work up something that makes you good. There is nothing good in us. But it's about faith. What is faith? What's this faith that we trust in? So the means of salvation is believing the gospel of Christ trusting in Christ alone, putting faith in Christ alone. In Hebrews, you know, faith is not just something that's ethereal. It's not just something that doesn't have any substance or meat to it. It's real and it's true. The writer of Hebrews says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When you understand the gospel and you embrace what Christ has done, we, it, it, it's, it's assured. It's a faith to complete. And you can rest in it. Again, I think Martin Luther makes it clear. The righteousness of God is the cause of our salvation. The righteousness of God is the cause of our salvation. This righteousness, however, is not that according to which God himself is righteous as God, but that which we are justified by him through faith in the gospel. It is called the righteousness of God, 
in contradistinction to man's righteousness which comes from works. You have to get that, Christian, because so often we think we have to work to please God. We do works, and I'm going to show you that in the third, my third point here, but not to please God, not to be forgiven by God, not to be loved by God. That's a complete mercy of God through faith. Paul will later tell us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being, here it is, this is this justified, just as if you had never sinned, and it's a gift of God, justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. Jesus literally propitiates the wrath of God. The wrath would either fall on us or it falls on his son for those that through grace believe. It's set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Why? To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You know what's wonder, wonderful about the power of this gospel? He gets all the glory and we get nothing. As it should be. Because we are glory hounds. <laughs> and we must be humble. So we are saved by faith alone plus nothing. But that faith, as we know, Luther would later say, is not alone. It will produce a life of faith walked out. Look at Romans 1.17 again. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. This faith is going to so change us. This gospel, the power, will so change the believer. We've seen it as we've worked through the introduction. It talks about the obedience of the faith, that we are sanctified as saints, set apart, living a life completely contrary to the way of the world. It's going to be walked out. It's going to be walked out by faith. Now we're Christian dads and moms. We're Christian children. We're Christian in our vocation. We're Christian in whatever we do. And there's going to be a way to live life that is in conformity to God's word. And that's what walking out faith looks like. The Hebrew writer says this way, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Okay, wonderful. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, listen to this, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There is a part for us to play in this faith. There is a part by which we're walking it out by faith. It's demonstrated in this life devoted to obeying Jesus as he taught us. The believer will be transformed. The faith that brings salvation is transformative. Paul, as I said, talked about the fruit he wanted to see in Rome. It was for folks to come to faith, and it was for them that had come to faith to grow in their faith and to live these sanctified lives. And, and I can just attest to that, too, again from Hebrews. They, uh, the Hebrew writer quotes that very same scripture, now the just shall live by faith. And he says it this way, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now, I think about, uh, John was sure of his testimony this morning about coming to faith. That, you know, there's sometimes when you walk in certain sins on purpose. I don't know if you've been a Christian, and you sin, and you think about the repentance you're going to do after you've already sinned, right? And, and, and it's a scary thing, because we should never take God's grace for granted like that. But because John was really drawn, and because I was in that same boat years before, it grieves your heart. I remember thinking to myself, I can't put Jesus to an open shame and, and, and take his sacrifice for granted. And my heart was changed at that point. So the means by which we're changed are these warnings. So he says, for if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Then here's this, this verse again. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So, so salvation is a complete work of God, like I was saying a few weeks ago. 
But walking out this sanctification is now synergistic. Now we do play a part in it. Now we are responsible to walk it out. It's that idea of lordship salvation. This is something I think since the first days I've ever preached here out of Matthew, I am always want to say, folks, we need to, to look to the Lord and obey him. Jesus is, if Jesus is not Lord, he cannot be Savior. Mm -hmm. If he is your Savior, he will be your Lord, and you will walk it out in obedience. For whatever, whatever is not of faith is sin, Paul later says. It wasn't just me that have said this. Now that I've been reading Lloyd-Jones and I read a lot of MacArthur, they say the same things, this idea of lordship salvation. You can look at it yourself in Romans 10, 8, and 9, but that idea of confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart, and it says the Lord Jesus. Christ must be Lord. Well, how do we know that he's Lord? We obey what he teaches us. Why do, how do we know what he teaches us? His word is very clear on how we need to live our lives in every area. Robert Haldane says this, By faith we give ourselves to Jesus Christ in order that he may possess and conduct us forever. When God justifies, he gives grace, but it is always in maintaining the rights of his majesty, in making us submit to his law and to the direction of his holiness, that Jesus Christ may reign in our hearts. So we need to see for sure that salvation is a complete work of God, that our righteousness is a gift, that it is by faith alone, but, but it's not alone. Now we walk it out. We, we obey him because of what he's done and the change in the spirit that he's placed in our hearts. We must talk the talk and walk the walk. If we talk the talk but don't walk the walk, are we saved? How about those that try to walk the walk, but don't talk the talk? They don't understand the gospel. There's so many good people out there trying to earn heaven by being good, probably people better than me, <laughs> that, that seem to be good in and of themselves. It does zip, zilch, nada. You must walk the walk and talk the talk, talk the talk and walk the walk. We have to understand the gospel and then write it out, walk it out. That's why Paul would say, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So in this, in this portion here, and in those two verses, there's so much doctrine, there's so much truth, and so much really mystery and wonder that is revealed in Christ but it's something we need to latch on to. And if, and if we're struggling with those concepts, come on, let's talk about it. But, but the scriptures are clear on these points. Martin Lloyd-Jones, again, we'll come up and sing our last song. Lloyd-Jones says this, the gospel of God, which is an essential part of salvation, is beyond this world and beyond this life. It is coming, it is certain, but not yet. We have been saved. We are being saved. We shall be fully and finally entirely saved. Salvation, great salvation, God's salvation. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for such a great salvation. We thank you, Lord, that this salvation is not dependent upon us. Because if it were, we would never be saved. But Lord, how great is a salvation that we wicked sinners who are walking in opposition to you would send your son to die for us when we were in rebellion. That, Lord, you would place your love upon us before we ever turn from our sins and trust in you. That, Lord God, you sent your own dear son in the likeness of flesh and for sinful flesh to pay that penalty we could never pay, to live the life we could never live so that we might be saved, forgiven. And Father God, now as you fill us with your Holy Spirit, by your grace, may we be those who walk by faith, who live by faith, who obey by faith, who demonstrate your greatness in our lives, Father. 
We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' precious name, amen.